Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanir rahim uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Dr. Ina Siddiqui, and I would like to welcome you all in the uh, sixth lecture of Distinguished Speaker Series, organized by Comstech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Comstech, apart from its various objective, is uh, firmly committed for the dissemination of uh, information and knowledge, and of course, uh, spread awareness about various uh, uh, burning issues, hot topics uh, that cover health related issues also. Today's lecture is based on one of this theme also. Uh, before taking your much time, I would like to request uh, you all to kindly keep your uh, microphone on mute mode so that we can listen our speaker carefully and uh, uh, clear. And I request my colleague Hazima from Comstech to kindly uh, take over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hina. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good day, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Hazima Mozam and from Comstech. Comstech is the Ministerial Standing Committee for Science and Technology. We operate in 57 member OIC countries. Our aim is to build and nourish the scientific culture in the OIC states uh, as an, as a, um, in order to boost the socioeconomic uh, uh, situation of the uh, 57 member OIC countries. And with this brief intro, I would like to um, invite Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary, Coordinator General Comstech and Director ICCBS to welcome and introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you very much, uh, Khazima Mozam, my colleague at Comstech and Dr. Hina Siddiqui. Thank you very much for uh, organizing this uh, seminar of distinguished Comstech scholars. And we uh, have uh, Professor Wasim Jafri with us again. It's always a pleasure. He's, a, he's a, not only a very distinguished scholar, a great humanist, but also a very dear friend. And his uh, attributes uh, are so numerous that I can talk about him for uh, quite some time. Let me reintroduce for the benefit of those people who are joining us for the first time. The speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Wasim Jafri, is a very distinguished scholar. He is currently associated with the premier institution of Pakistan, Khan University of Health Sciences in Karachi. And uh, he is a professor of medicine and consultant, uh, gastroenterologist and hepatologist. He had been the chair of uh, medicine and uh, section head of gastroenterology in this previous institution. He's also been the director of the World Gastroenterology Organization, Karachi, uh, since 1998, and uh, chair of ACT, Hepatitis Pakistan, member of the association, uh, guideline committee of the Asian Pacific uh, uh, Association for the study of liver, advisor to Asian Pacific Association for the study of liver, and he has been, uh, he has also worked with WHO on SCV. So his insight and his experience is very uh, firsthand. He is the one who practice and work with the patients and has great insight about this spread the problem which SCV offer. The topic which uh, Dr. Wasim Jafri is also uh, is covering today is also one of the key topics on which he has conducted lots of research. So let me tell you his research credentials are equally impressive. Uh, he, uh, his research work uh, has, uh, has been cited over 12,000 times, which is a very large number of citations in the field of health sciences. And uh, his H index, uh, which is uh, also very high, over 51, is something which is reflective of the, uh, of the impact of his research. His I index, which means that his research publication cited uh, uh, over 150 times is also 150, which primarily means that at least 150 research papers of in his credentials have been cited so many times. So he is certainly a very well versed and uh, a person who has worked in this field since long. Uh, the topic he's covering is extremely important because hepatitis, as we understand, is very widespread. Uh, this is a problem of LDC countries, low developing countries. Is also a silent killer because very often the disease is diagnosed 
when it is already too late. So um, Dr. Jaffrey is going to talk about how hepatitis B and C from the, from the identification of disease till this ambitious plan of its elimination in 2013 is the status today, how people are affected. So I request Professor Dr. Wasim Jaffrey for this very exciting and equally important presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Iqbal Chaudhary. It's been a blessing to have a friend like you. And I'm overwhelmed by your you know, wonderful, wonderful introduction. Uh, yes, hepatitis is something which is, which is there since medieval times. And certainly we are struggling with it and struggling immensely. Currently, the target date is 2030 when WHO and all the countries fully affiliated with it have signed that by that time, we are going to eliminate at hepatitis B and C. So 2030 is just down the road. So let's start this journey where we started and how this 2030 has come about. And in the next hour or so, I'm going to cover both aspects, the discovery and then elimination. Today's day is very particular in the calendar year because it's dedicated to World Hepatitis Day for the last few years and would continue to be dedicated for the next foreseeable future. And the theme that W and the World Hepatitis Alliance along with WHO and other agencies selected for today is find the missing millions. It's not really thousands or hundreds or whatever, but it is in millions. And in Southeast Asia, where Pakistan is a member country, 97% of men and women living with viral hepatitis don't know about it. Look at that, 97% don't know about it. Unless detected and treated, it can cause liver disease, cirrhosis, and most unfortunately, liver cancer, which is a deadly cancer. So the theme is find the missing millions. Nine in 10 people living with viral hepatitis don't know about it. So hence the importance of diagnosis. And if we are not aware of it, certainly we have to test about it and then come to a diagnosis before it could be deadly. So that's the theme and that's the importance of today's day is that we need to be sensitized enough our governments of all the countries that are signatory to this elimination program must really uh, come, come out of it, whatever they are doing and try to achieve the goal target. Global burden of different diseases producing mortality all other causes, then cardiovascular conditions, 16.7 million, the infectious diseases, 15 million almost, followed by neoplastic diseases, injuries, asthma, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And 15 million, that is more than 25% of 57 million annual deaths, according to WHO worldwide, are estimated to be related directly to infectious diseases, but this does not include the deaths that occur as a consequence of complications associated with chronic infections, such as liver failure and liver cancer in people infected with hepatitis B or C viruses, and I'm going to disclose those figures too. Cirrhosis produces, which is a consequence of hepatitis B and C along with other causes, almost like a million deaths, 783,000 deaths per year. Liver cancer accounts for 619,000 deaths. So putting these two together, it comes to about 1.4 million deaths per year related to liver diseases from cirrhosis and cancer. So one of every 40 deaths worldwide is attributed to this organ of our body and due to these two diseases. Let's go on to the journey from where we found all these things. The hepatitis B virus was really the, the brilliant work of Professor Bloomberg. 
And in 1965, through his hard work and the team that he was working with in New York, found this uh, virus. And it was not called HBV then, it was called the Australia antigen. So hepatitis B virus started as an Australia antigen, and I'll come to you why it was called like that, followed by the A virus in seven, HAV, hepatitis A virus by Feinstone, 1973, the HDV by Mario Rosetto in Italy, 1977, HCV by Professor Houghton's team, who was his associate 1989, and HEV by Rice in 1990. So they are the five hepatotropic viruses. Out of these five, only three produce chronicity, which is B, C, and D. And D would not affect anybody if he or she has got no B. So anybody who has got hepatitis B is potentially susceptible to get hepatitis D virus but D is a small virus. It does not survive without the surface antigen of hepatitis B virus. So what happened in 1965, we came to know about the B virus. And then in 1973, the A virus, the hepatitis puzzle was still incomplete. So he is the great scientist, a great person, and I'm very fortunate to know him personally as well in, you know, as this um, phonograph about him by Professor Halter says that in the 2000 years since Hippocrates described the skin yellowing conditions he termed Icterus, no single event has been more pivotal to the understanding and prevention of viral hepatitis than the discovery of Australia antigen by Bruce. Bloomberg. This antigen which Bloomberg found in the blood of an Australian aborigine turned out to be the surface antigen of hepatitis B virus. This finding ultimately led to the test to screen blood donors for the virus and to the hepatitis vaccine. For all his contributions, finally, in 1976, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And finally, Professor Halter summarizes this great person by writing, Barry was a complex and a brilliant, imaginative and adventurous, tenacious and dedicated and deeply philosophical man of eclectic interest and myriad accomplishments. A great person who really brought home to us the hepatitis B virus and the vaccine that in fact, through his hard work, we came to know. And this was the first vaccine that WHO dedicated as an anti-cancer vaccine because hepatitis B produces liver cancer. And if you prevent B, you don't have the, uh, the liver cancer related to the B virus. So what about the global prevalence of hepatitis B virus infection? Around half of the world population reside in HBV endemic area. So around 2 billion people have been exposed to hepatitis B V infection. Out of that, 300 to 400 million have gone into chronic hepatitis B in, you know, disease. So global population, 6 billion, 2 billion are exposed because half of the reside in that area. 15 to 25% die of cirrhosis and liver cancer. Each year, 1 million die of hepatitis BV related liver failure, cirrhosis, and HCC. So, this is the map according to the World Health Organization the different regions the African region, the regions of Americas, Southeast Asia. Europe and Middle Eastern or Eastern Mediterranean region, followed by Western Pacific somewhere here. So the African region has got the highest prevalence figure of 8.83% out of a global figure of 3.61. The Americas, the North and the South, 8.81 million, the Eastern Mediterranean, 3.01, 
European 2.06, Southeast Asia 1.90, and Western Pacific 5.26. Pakistan, according to WHO, really is in the Eastern Mediterranean region where the total number is 3.01. And we are in the intermediate zone where it, the prevalence is two to 8% along with Libya, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and Tunisia. So there is the highest comes from Djibouti, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. And the low figures are the rest, including Palestine, Qatar, Egypt, Bahrain, Afghanistan, et cetera. This is the map of our beloved country, which is plagued with hepatitis B and C viruses and all other problems that we know about it. And we have got areas which have got more than 5% and anybody's guess is at 10% or 20 or whatnot, but certainly it's more than that on an aggregate of 5%. And then there are low areas, but at the same time, intermediate between 2.5 to 5. The changing global hepatitis surface antigen and density, 59 to 89, it was about 1% coverage of infant three doses of vaccine. However, when the WHO revisited in, 20, in 1990 to 2013, some of the red areas you see have gone into different shapes because the vaccine is very, very effective if it is given to infants you know, right at the birth. And I'll emphasize later on this subject when it comes to prevention. We were interested how we are doing. So the changing trends of hepatitis B seromarkers amongst Pakistani population. And this was a laboratory-based review from 185,825 patients. So what did we find about it? We found that you know, the trends from 2001 to 2008. So we came to know that the mean age of reactive hepatitis B surface antigen patients was 30 plus minus 12.5 years. The surface antigen reactivity was significantly higher in males than females. And this was also uh, seen by Bloomberg when we, when, he, when we first found this virus as Australia antigen. Surface antigen showed a slight decline in percentage reactivity during the eight-year period with a gradual increase in surface antibody reactivity was observed. Of the total, 23% of patients belong to the susceptible to infection category. 39% of patients were classified as chronically ill. 12% patients were categorized as immune due to hepatitis B vaccine, only 12%. 3% were classified. Sorry. There is a background, somebody is talking, please. Can, can you look into that? The study substantiated the general perception that levels of B surface antigen is showing a decreasing trend while levels of B surface antibody are increasing perhaps due to better vaccination of the population. And this is all depicted in this graphic slide as well. So finally, Conclusion was that acquisition of hepatitis B virus infection seems to be occurring at an early age with wide variation in its prevalence in different geographical regions within Pakistan. And I've shown you that map. There is a decreasing trend of disease transmission, but for its further effective control needs to be done through the federal government, the blood, the World Health Organization and other funding agencies need to work in collaboration. The our childhood vaccination program has to be strengthened, not for just B, for other diseases as well. And as you all very well know that we are still not polio free country because of all what is uh, you know, going on. As I've already said that hepatitis B patients are also susceptible for the hepatitis Delta or the D. And in our country, we have got a huge population of B suffering from Delta or HDV as well. And we can go on from 31%, 34% in different studies, according to ours. This was from, from you know, one of our own studies, 35%. So the susceptibility is enormous. 
And of course, we have different pockets in Pakistan where Delta virus and B are together in the same patient producing more illness and more worries for the patient and all the household. Can it be cured? That's a big question mark that patients would like to ask at each time they see us. Chronic hepatitis B is a global health problem. So we have elimination of hepatitis B infection and HBV related diseases. How do I do that? HBV susceptible individual can really be made uh, you know, safe by timely vaccination and universal precautions. However, if you have already acquired hepatitis B and C, we need to put you on antiviral treatment to, to really take care of chronic hepatitis going into cirrhosis and HCC stands for liver cancer. So timely treatment is very important there. So current treatments the, is through viral suppression and sustained disease control. Mind the world control. I cannot offer cure for hepatitis B currently with whatever we have globally. So it's not that we are short of any medicines, but hepatitis B can only be controlled. Nature definitely can cure anything, and it does in a small number of cases, but majority of patients who get infected have to be treated to control the hepatitis B problem. Through viral suppression by medicines, we call the nukes, the nucleotide and nucleoside analogs. And of course, when we put them on these antiviral treatment, we want to decrease inflammation, fibrosis, and disease progression. This is your normal liver, and this is the chronic hepatitis. The reversal of fibrosis and decreased progression, that's the aim. Reversal of whatever go has gone wrong. And of course, I would like to halt or decrease progression. And when I do that, and I am able to achieve through the nukes, decreased incidence, but not eliminated of liver cancer. So we can certainly, timely treatment has got positive response, but you know some of those people who come to us late cannot be prevented from liver cancer. This is the stigma that patient carries. This is the surface antigen as a screening test for hepatitis B, and the maximum 10% is after five years of treatment. So 90% of patients with the B virus stigma stays positive no matter how long I can treat them, unless, of course, the nature is kind on a subset of population that look after themselves very well, that they can get rid of the surface antigen, which could be, in fact, not more than 10%, it's maximum. But the next slide or this slide tells you the, the availability of these drugs, which are extremely potent and good, and Dacovit, and Nofavir, and pegylated interferon, and look, the surface antigen loss, which is the screening test or the stigma, 2%, 3.2%, 2.9% in hepatitis B E antigen positive patients and hepatitis B E antigen negative. So these are two classes of hepatitis B viruses, E antigen positive, E antigen negative. Only 0.3%, 0%. So once infected or the, you are always infected, but what you can do with the treatment is to control the disease so that at least some of the uh, calamities, some of the uh, you know, aftermaths like chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis, and liver cancer can be reduced in number or prevented. So this is the state of the art treatment globally available to us. We can provide to our patients with very cost-effective management and hence control the disease. Each time you would see control for hepatitis B and not cure. So what are we going to do in future? We must talk about cure because I think that's what our patients need from us. Will we need a combination of treatment from you know, the antiviral treatment with immune therapy? And I think that is going to come in. The antivirals are available. Immune restoration certainly has to be there with all the nuclear, nucleoside, nucleotide and, uh, analogs the capsids, the small RNA um, and loads. And for immune restoration, we are working on, and lots of work has been happening in checkpoint inhibitors, the therapeutic vaccine, 
and the TLR agonists. So hopefully, as time passes by, we should be able to offer cure to our patients. But right now, 2020, 28th of uh, July, we can offer control to our patients for hepatitis B, but nature cures it in some of the patients, but through treatment, it's only control as, as I stand today. What about prevention? This is the state of the art and WHO certainly emphasizes it and provides all the necessary guidelines to all the countries in order to prevent hepatitis B right from the word go. If a child in the first year, in the first month, in the first week on the day of birth gets infected, you know, this, this uh, uh, he becomes a patient for the rest of his life because no matter what happens, 95% or 90% is going to be hepatitis B positive. In the adults, for instance, 30, 40, 25, if they get hepatitis B for the first time, their own immunity would be able to majority of the time cure it. So the vaccination for hepatitis B is at birth. And that's a very, very strong message that WHO wants to emphasize and re-emphasize. The yeast-derived monovalent through uh, the DNA technology, recombinant DNA technology, or combination vaccines with DPT, influenza B, or IPP, the injectable polio vaccine. Allergy to yeast is contraindicated. So Taiwan was the first one to introduce this vaccine and they showed an enormous decrease in incidence of HCC, the liver cancer, 60.1%. 76.3% decrease in mortality from fulminant liver hepatic failure. 92% decrease in mortality from chronic liver disease. So yes, if you know common sense prevails and you know, you know, the infant dose, the birth dose comes into it, lots of good news can be shared with uh, you know with these uh, uh, with, with the community that you have reduced the incidence. Excellent safety profile. This has been, there's no comment to, to say that it is not safe or anything. It's a very safe vaccine. It's cost effective, particularly as part of triple elimination strategy to eliminate mother to child transmission of HIV, hepatitis B and syphilis. So yes, a mother who is hepatitis B positive can give it to the newborn at the time of birth. So hence this newborn has to be vaccinated and given immunoglobulin if the mother is positive or otherwise if mother is negative, he or she would only receive the vaccine and not the immunoglobulin. WHO's position on it, WHO recognizes the importance of hepatocellular carcinoma and other HBV related diseases as global public health problems and reiterates its recommendations that hepatitis B vaccine should be included in national immunization programs, and it is in our national immunization, pro uh, immunization program in Pakistan. A comprehensive approach to eliminating hepatitis B transmission must address prevention of infections acquired perinatally, just at the time of birth and during childhood, as well as prevention of infections acquired by adolescents when they are growing up in schools and about to go to college and in adults, reaching all children with at least three doses of hepatitis B vaccine should be the standard for all national immunization programs. Here comes the birth dose. Hepatitis B vaccination is recommended for all children worldwide and all national programs should include a monovalent hepatitis B vaccine birth dose, ideally within 24 hours. If that is not feasible for any you know, reason one can think of, then at least within the seven days, or at least as soon as a healthcare provider, really at any time up to the time of next dose. So it has to be given the soonest, you know, at the time of birth, within few days after birth, as soon as one can think of, it should be given. It's a three dose schedule. The second, third dose is given with first and third doses of DPT. This is excellent if that can be done. Or four dose with a monovalent birth dose following three doses given with other routine infant vaccines, four weeks apart. So they have to be, you know, 
after a month of gap in each dose. And there is no evidence to support need for booster dose. Catch-up vaccination should be considered if you have missed one or two doses, considered based on available resources. Vaccination groups of highest risk of acquiring HBV infection is recommended. So those who have missed the boat and have not received previous vaccination, they must be vaccin vaccinated if they belong to all these serious groups where they can acquire it. Patients who frequently require blood and blood products, the thalassemics, for instance, or the renal failure patients, dialysis, diabetic patients who need, you know, these um, uh, dialysis because of kidney failure, recipients of solid organ transplants, persons with chronic liver disease or HIV, persons interned in prisons, persons who use injecting drugs, household sexual contacts of persons with chronic hepatitis B virus infection, and men who have sex with men, persons with multiple sexual partners, healthcare workers and others who may be exposed to potentially infectious body fluids during the work. So this group is at risk all the time and they must be, if they are still to be, you know, they have been negative and they were not vaccinated, they should be. HIV positive individuals should be vaccinated as early as possible in the course of HIV infection. Immunocompromised individuals may have reduced immune response following vaccination. Vaccination is safe for pregnant and lactating women. This is this must go to every person because you know lots of ignorance is still there, and you know women who are pregnant or lactating may not be offered. We will do it later on, but they can be. It is safe. A birth dose can be given to low birth weight and premature infants. So again, a birth dose is safe if the baby is low birth weight or premature. Strategy for implementation, national strategies to prevent perinatal transmission should ensure high and timely coverage of birth dose through a combination of strengthened maternal and infant care at birth with skilled health workers, present to administer the vaccine and innovative outreach strategies to provide vaccine for infants born at home. Increased proportion of infants born in health facilities and health promotion efforts to eliminate false contraindications. This is again very, very important. Unease over vaccinating low birth weight and premature infants. They can be vaccinated as I've already highlighted concerns over adverse reactions. It's one of the safest vaccine, fear of vaccine wastage and personal cost concern and other cultural prohibitions. One need to look into all these things as well. And then again, it's not easy. You have to be have a good reporting and monitoring. You know, reporting and monitoring systems should be strengthened to improve the quality of data on birth dose. So that is foremost. We don't know how it is happening in our country, although we are signatory and we should be offering a birth dose, but you know, reality on the ground is far from unknown. To monitor accurately the delivery of doses given within 24 hours of birth, these doses should be recorded as a timely birth dose of hepatitis B vaccine to differentiate them from birth doses given later. So within 24 hours or whatever one need to look at and serological surveys of hepatitis B virus surface antigen prevalence representative of the target population will serve as the primary tool to measure the impact of vaccination. So if I know the reality today, and if I revisit in five years and 10 years, then I would know, yes, this program that I started was successful because of all the vaccinations. So we should have the data and we should be, you know, it should be available at any time when we would like to compare our results for effectiveness or otherwise. So I think I have to switch gears now for hepatitis C virus because you know B, we have covered enough with a lot of emphasis on vaccination because there was no cure, only control through drugs. And vaccination is the real strategy to bring in an enormous change when we talk of elimination C. I'm going to again take the journey from discovery and then ongoing elimination efforts and target 2030. 1989, I've already showed you that that was the time. So Bloomberg 
And Alter helped us in 1965 with the Australia antigen. So as I've already shown you this slide that we still don't have C there you know, uh, on this picture. So what was it? Hepatitis was still there and we would call it, it seems likely that you know, patients were screened for hepatitis B and A, but still lots of blood transfusions when they were given for a variety of reasons, the result was that patients, you know, you give transfusion to save somebody's life, not to make him miserable, but they were getting hepatitis. And it seems likely that at least a proportion of such antigen negative, so B antigen negative, transfusion associated hepatitis is caused by other infectious agent not yet identified 1975. So here we are. So lots of transfusion related hepatitis was happening and we would just not know what the cause was. I was interested in this too as well and I found that almost 10% of post-transfusion hepatitis was caused by this unidentified virus and we used to call it non-A, non-B, transfusion associated hepatitis at that time. So here is this wonderful news game which settled this query through the work of Professor Houghton and his team in California, isolation of cDNA clone derived from a blood-borne non-A, non-B viral hepatitis genome. So that was a great breakthrough where we came to know about this you know, mess of transfusion associated hepatitis as to what it was. And here is this great man. I've shown you the picture of uh, Dr. Bloomberg. And this is Michael Houghton and Harvey J. Alter. Alter also worked with Bloomberg for the discovery of B virus. <coughs> now this is state of the art. Look how they were basically doing work for all of us. And Michael Houghton writes this in his commentary published in 2002. The molecular identification of hepatitis C virus was the culmination of a team effort spanning seven years during which hundreds of millions of bacterial cDNA clones were screened for a putative non-A, non-B hepatitis origin using many, many different approaches. Only one positive clone was the result of this strenuous effort. And then he further writes, if he had missed or lost 511, that was the strain. 511 from the library, we may still be looking for hepatitis C virus. So that's the history of hepatitis C, transfusion associated non-A, non-B hepatitis in 19675, transmitted to chimpanzees in 1978, the genome was cloned in 1989, and the initial classification was flaviviridae and then hep C virus. And here is the zero prevalence of hepatitis C virus, 170 to 200 million worldwide, WHO once again. And we are here, 30 to 35 million, the United States, 5 million, Eastern Europe, 10, Western Europe, 5. Egypt had the highest prevalence of 4 million, 45% adults, more than 40 years. And this was due to, due to you know, the same use of syringes and needles through the schistosomiasis with you know, treatment of antimony and all what was happening in Egypt at that time. Africa, 30 to 40 million. Americas, 12 to 15 million. And Southeast Asia, 30 to 35. Australia, 0.2 million. Western Pacific, 16 million. 70 million people. So out of prevalence of... of 170 to 200 million worldwide. Worldwide. I hear a lot of lot of background noise. Could somebody mute them, please? So 70 million developed chronic hepatitis in 2015. And we know that most unfortunately, when it comes to the figure of 70 million, Pakistan is number two after China. But China certainly has got billions of, you know, compared to Pakistan's population, an enormously populated country. 
and they show a total viremic infection in millions to about 10, and we show almost like reaching 7.5 or 8, followed by India, Egypt, and other countries. So the only good uh, survey that happened was in 2008, and that proved that the B virus surface anti antigen was 2.5% when they looked at in different in all areas of Pakistan, and anti-HCV was 4.9, almost like 5% with the total 7.4 on an average about 12 million people, you know, at that time with the population that we had in 2008 were infected. And all that was attributed to WHO allows 3.5 injections per year per person. And this study showed that Pakistan has 13.6 injections per person per year. And this is the reuse of the same needles and syringes and all that was something. If you use a new syringe each time and all that bit. Now this practice at 2008 was rife and common. And through all the education that has gone in, at least people are sensitive and you know they're not using the syringes anymore, but it used to be a common practice then and we could continue to suffer due to bad old practices for a you know, long, long time. Even our children are not spared. When I looked at 3,533 children in screen them for both, 1,826, 52% were males and we found 1.8% positivity for hepatitis B surface antigen and 1.6% uh, uh, for hepatitis C. So that means even our children were not spared when we uh, looked at all these uh, figures of 3.3% of B and C combined in this study population. Hepatitis C is not just one virus, it has got six major genotypes and they were in fact very important to test before the current medicines that are available because of course, previously the interferon was very good medicine for genotype three, but not as good for genotype one. And we needed we need genotype before we started the treatment. And our own genotype is genotype three. And we looked at it with seriousness. It's 87, 90% of our all patients were genotype three. And that was the good genotype to have for interferon treatment with some better results than genotype one. So our genotype is three. And you know when you go to Thailand and over Chinese population, it becomes more six. Africa, in fact, about four and five. And Americas would have, you know, in Europe, genotype one was predominant. Advanced liver disease due to hepatitis C infection is a huge global burden. 27% of cirrhosis is all due to hepatitis C. So an estimated one in every four cases of cirrhosis or liver cancer worldwide can be attributed to hepatitis C virus. Can you believe it? So every fourth case of cirrhosis, every fourth case of liver cancer, just due to one bug hepatitis C virus. And our own figures don't differ much. When we looked at this figure, we found that hepatitis C for liver cancer was almost 70% of all liver cancers in Pakistan was related to C virus. 20% was B virus, concomitant B with C or D about 10%. So C was the major cause, is the major cause of liver cancer in Pakistan. And now here, the primary goal of HCV treatment is viral eradication. It's not control, it is eradication. You just eradicate to cure the patient if you treat them well. And that is called SVR, sustained virological response, which is 12 weeks after the completion of treatment now, or used to be 24 weeks when the interferon was used. So if somebody is negative 12 weeks post-treatment with the currently available treatment, he or she is cured from hepatitis C. When we do that, we reduce the progression of fibrosis and cirrhosis, we prevent liver decompensation and we may prevent HCC as well. By doing that, by doing that, hepatitis C cures or reduces all cause mortality from 26% to less than 10%. 
liver related mortality from almost 30% to less than 2% and liver cancer from 22% to less to almost like 5%. So everything in fact goes in patient's favor, well, favor when we are able to cure him by providing him timely treatment. We have lots and lots of good medicine for hepatitis C and the major breakthrough happened in December 2013 when sofosfovir was made available as the first oral treatment for hepatitis C. And 2013 to 2017, we have got at least 14, 15 drugs added to the list where we can provide wonderful treatment for hepatitis C patients providing overwhelming cure of 97% or even 99% if we are able to pick them up in good time. The genetic heterogeneity of hepatitis C virus unfortunately has prevented the development of vaccine because there is no vaccine now or in near future. I've emphasized through lots of literature review by WHO about hepatitis B vaccine but there is no such thing for hepatitis C due to high viral uh, rate of viral persistence, lack of solid immunity, and genetic heterogeneity. So what next, ladies and gentlemen? Elimination is down the road 2030. Why do we say that elimination is so important? Why? Because the deaths from number of deaths per year from selected conditions viral hepatitis producing more deaths than HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria when you look at 2010 and 2013 figures. There is a difference between elimination and eradication. Even when we eliminate, this elimination requires continued measures to prevent re-establishment of disease transmission. So that is elimination, whereas if you eradicate, if a disease has been eradicated, no further control measures are required. And the one that I'm familiar with is called smallpox, which has been eradicated, hence there is no further control that is happening for smallpox. So lots of people talk about this elimination. Is it a myth or a reality? Let's review some of the next few slides to make up our own minds regarding this. In 2009, viral hepatitis was on agenda of World Health Assembly for the first time. In 2014, the WHA resolution examines the feasibility of elimination of hepatitis B and C. 2015 was the year when WHO, the Regional Action Program on Hepatitis, Viral Hepatitis was adopted. 2015 Glasgow Declaration with the first World Hepatitis Summit. And 2016 was the year when adoption of first global health sector strategy on viral hepatitis eliminate viral hepatitis as a major public health threat by 2030. So just to summarize, the World Health Assembly requested May 2014, Sustainable Development Goals 2015, September, and of course, hence, there was growing movement around hepatitis. The patient voices and demands, the civil society momentum build up, increasing numbers with national plans, and some global partners uh, got into it with UNITID, the CHI, the Clinton Health uh, Program, and the Medicine Sans uh, France. This is all agencies that are contributing towards this elimination from, from GLOBE for hepatitis. The elimination in the sustainable development goal era as a public health threat for HIV, malaria, sexually transmitted infections, tuberculosis, and viral hepatitis. So towards the vision of a world where viral hepatitis transmission is halted and everyone living with viral hepatitis, mind the words, everyone living with viral hepatitis has access to safe, affordable and effective prevention, care and treatment services through these five strategic directions. Information for focused action, interventions for impact, delivering for equity, financing for sustainability and innovation for acceleration. 
here we are. The baseline figures are hepatitis B vaccine to 82% should reach 90% by 2030. Mother to childhood trans uh, transmission by the birth dose is only 38% 2015, 50% 2020 should reach 90%. Safe injections, 90% is the target 2030. Harm reduction, 75% of coverage. HBV treatment, 80%, and HCV treatment, 80%, which means that 8 million treated, 5 million hepatitis B, and 3 million hepatitis C. And the figures in 2015 is less than 1% going on to 80%. HBV treatment, less than 1% going on to 80%. And same is, in fact, the mother to child transmission through the birth dose vaccine, 38% should go on to 90% safe injection. And our country is one of the countries which was listed because uh, you know safe injections were not very common, but now they are. And so 5% Can't we mute them? Safe injection, 5% going on to 90%. If we can achieve all these things, the elimination targets by for B and C, new infections, six to 10 million infections in 2015 to less than a million. That means 900,000 by 2030. 1.4 million deaths in 2015 should be under 500,000 deaths by 2030. So all this would be such a great news provided we reach our goals by 2030. How are we going to do that? I've already emphasized incidence targets, 30% reduction in new infections 2020, which is this year, to 80% reduction of new infections by 2030. How are we going to do that? Find the person, find the patient, find the you know, person who is suffering from it by testing him. Mortality targets, 10% reduction in 2020, going on to 65% 2030. Harm reduction, increase in sterile needle and syringes provided per patients who inject drugs here for 20 to 2015, 200 to 2030. This is a very common mode of transmission in the West because injectable drugs is very common. So people with injection drug abuse, you know, if you can't stop him, at least provide them with sterile needle and syringes so they don't harm themselves and others. Testing targets is 90% of people aware by 2030 and treatment targets 80% treated by 2030. The quantum of viral hepatitis services and the retention cascade now with people with injecting drug abuse should, should be there. And they should not be neglected because that pool would exist and would keep on infecting other people. So we looked at this, this figure in our setup in male prisoners in Karachi and we found that 18.4% were infected with that, almost 20%. This is just one prison. With, and the therapeutic injections given by glass syringes, use of injectable drugs, sharing razors, and illiteracy were associated with higher risk acquiring HCV infection. So ladies and gentlemen, a people-centered health system for hepatitis elimination has to come in. And these are the four areas that one need to work on, develop national strategy, a workforce, we need to have the proper budget, effective monitoring and surveillance and strategies for engaging former or active people with injecting drug abuse and capacity to monitor disease progression. And we require national health programs. Lots of countries have already developed it and we have contributions from Pakistan as well. There exists a plan somewhere, and that is operational as well. And that plan is the Pakistan National Hepatitis Strategy Framework. And this is the plan that somewhere it exists and is in operation. Essential goals to eliminate hepatitis C, a secure of great political commitment for HCV, and we do have it. There is no doubt about it. And we need to expand our screening program. That needs to be state of the art. Universal screening, non-traditional screening sites, such as you know, anybody, any patient or attendant, if you can get hold of it and you start screening. So screen 85% of the target population, urgent care, dental clinics, behavioral health, 
OBGYN, the obstetrics and gynecology, through electronic health reminders, the rapid test and lab trigger screening, all this would be very handy to screen 85%. Evaluate 85%, treat 85%, and cure 85%. That should be the target. Reduce the incidence of new infections by public and provider awareness to develop a, you know, all the social media and all WhatsApp and everything can be taken, you know, and messages can be sent across so that people are more alert about it. And that would be so handy. Egypt is a great success story. You reported 45% and currently it is less than 7%. Now, in fact, that's a magnificent job that they have done through political commitment, mass information, national committee was formed, right people for the right job, national work of uh, network of treatment centers, local production of medicines, know your epidemic, 90% there was genotype four, ours is genotype three. And of course, all this was so magnificently done, hats off to them that they have, they are looking for patients now. That is the story of success there. So could hepatitis B and C, could they be globally eliminated by 2030? I would probably leave thoughts in your mind, but leaving no one behind towards equitable global elimination of hepatitis B. So this is a recent contribution in which we have emphasized that national governments and global health communities must recognize the risk of history repeating itself and do not allow hepatitis C to follow the same path as TB. With incidence of HCV on the rise, the role of drug resistance still unknown and the importance of poverty alleviation underplayed, the warning signs are there to see. Our time is now. Let us combine the fantastic opportunity provided by the development of direct acting antivirals with knowledge, sharing, national leadership, and the necessary financial commitments to meet WHO goal of eliminating hepatitis C as a public health threat globally by 2030. And unfortunately, and most unfortunately, here comes the COVID-19 pandemic. While no public health leader questions the need to respond to SARS-CoV-2 with speed and appropriate action, the COVID-19 pandemic has emerged at a particularly clear to critical time in Pakistan's effort to eliminate hepatitis B and C. Due to disruptions brought by the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of new treatment dropped since March onward. And given constraints in the budgets anticipated in the face of COVID-19 response, the hepatitis elimination programs at federal and provincial levels may or would be affected. Today, we are fighting with an important public health threat, COVID-19, which certainly needs special attention without a word of doubt. But we should be more careful about our previous public health achievements. If we cannot have progress about them these days, at least we should keep them at their current situation and avoid stepping backward to reach the goal of viral hepatitis elimination by 2030. So these are my concluding remarks that energy, commitment, and resources have to be there. A public health approach with simplification, integration, affordability, but most important is equitable access. Everyone should be treated equally. Partnerships between government, civil society, and private sector, and keep adding to it, would be so handy. Concrete and tailored action in countries guided by national plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jafri. Yet another excellent presentation, something which is so extremely important. Lots That's of the need of the hour, sir. Yeah, absolutely. And this is certainly, <laughs> and as you mentioned, as you mentioned that the, this pandemic, unfortunately, has uh, you know lots of diseases which are affecting humanity at large and since long has really been placed on back burner and I hope that we come out of this pandemic and uh, start uh, uh, giving the due attention which these disease deserves. Now I open uh, the floor for questions.
question to Professor Dr. Wasim Jafri now. Hello, Dr. Jafri, can you hear me? Gee, we can hear you. Can yeah, you? we can hear uh, you. Yeah, Dr. Jafri, uh, Dr. Agbani, Habib Agbani. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent and comprehensive talk. Now, my concern is uh, you mentioned vaccination and elimination by 2020. Now, as far as I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, hepatitis B vaccine was introduced in EPI sometime in 1980, probably 1980s. Now, since then, 40 years have passed, we've not been able to achieve the targets. And what make you believe that by 2020, we will be able to eliminate hepatitis B, where the basic healthcare structure is not there in Pakistan. And I've, I think it is impossible to achieve that target. What do you think your comments are? I think you have spelled it, uh, you know, brilliantly because we've had this vaccine, you know, for almost 40 plus years. And there's a lot of success stories that have come from China and Taiwan and certain other countries. So there is not a word of doubt if sincerity and hard work and dedication and honesty prevails. And we have check and balance. We have the right people for the right job then you know one has to be optimistic and all these areas should be looked at by people who are at the helm of affairs that you know why the figures that were there in 20 let's say 20 or 2 or 20 audience still is there somebody has to answer all those questions and those people are right there and people may have some kind of answers to their shortcomings but at the end of the day i think the fear is that is it a myth or a reality that by 2030 we would be one of those countries where hepatitis is eliminated. And going on further, in fact, even before that polio vaccine, we are still struggling with polio, aren't we? You know, why the heck, you know, you know and these, these are realities that, you know, we need to have security for our lady health visitors who go door to door to produce few drops in a baby's mouth. And, you know, somebody behind them has to provide them security. They are going to save the life of our coming generation and they need security to go and put those drops. Habib, you are part of us now that you are in the UK, you know that, you know, you've lived here and we have worked together as well, that yes, your fears are absolutely genuine. So are my fears too. But you know, you can't live with fears. You still continue to work like I'm doing and lots and lots of other people are doing. So we are very proud of what we have done, but at the same time, I think there are so much to really improve from where we are and where we should be. Uh, Jafri, so I totally agree with your comments. Hopefully, inshallah, in a lifetime, we may be able to see a success in this uh, disease. Now, another uh, point I would like to mention is you said a uh, screening program. Now, who is going to afford to pay for this screening? Why don't we just, instead of a screening, why don't we just, at every uh, possible point, we give them a vaccine, whether they had vaccine before or not? Is it going to cause any harm? It's not going to cause any harm, but is it not necessary in a country which has got a significant prevalence? You know, by the time you are 13, 14, and 15, I mean, you see 46%, according to our study, have already had exposure. So you would be wasting those 46% of your resources by vaccinating those people who otherwise have got the virus in them. Are you doing anything intelligent there? Yeah, so first dose uh, vaccine is the answer for that thing that, you know, if you start that, a, a baby who is born today would be an adult in 20 years or 10 years at least, he would be school going. So you have prevented hepatitis B in a whole generation if you vaccinate them on 28th of July, which is today, 2020. So, and, 20, and tomorrow again, 20. So that is how the strategy should be. We should not focus on today. We should focus tomorrow and day after. And that has been the neglect story that you know people go for very short-term benefits rather than focusing on, you know, for our coming generation in the next 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, where we should be. Yeah, so I would not like to vaccinate adults unless I know their status, whether they have had exposure, because I know if core antibody is positive in 46% randomly seen, 
So would I be doing an intelligent or cost effective if I vaccinate those 46% randomly? I would be saving a lot of money by screening them and then in fact not vaccinating them or vaccinating if they are uh, still not, um, not exposed. Thank you so much, sir. Um, and uh, I would like to thank all the participants also. Uh, since we are running ahead of time, I request uh, Coordinator General Comstech to uh, say the final word. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Vaseem Jafri. We can really uh, sit and listen to you for hours. Because there are time zones, and I can know, I, I can see that there are uh, there are participants from Indonesia and Malaysia also, which is already late in the evening. And in the interest of everyone, I would close this session with the uh, great appreciation and admiration for dear friend, Ambassador Dr. Vaseem Jaffrey, for yet another very, very good and very important presentation. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good Eid al Adha. And mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everyone and uh, save us and humanity at large. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before we uh, just leave, I have uh, one announcement from my colleague, uh, Ms. Kazima, that uh, certificates of this lecture and the, all previous lectures are available. So uh, our uh, coordination office will send uh, the certificates, e-certificates actually to all participants. Thank you so much, sir, once again. Thank you. <laughs>